live from Midtown Manhattan, the Cube's live coverage of Big Data NYC, a Silicon Angle Wikibon production, made possible by Hortonworks. We do Hadoop and Wham Disco. Hadoop made invincible. And now your co-hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Well, hello, everyone. We're live here in New York City for Big Data NYC. This is the event where we're covering what's going on in the big data world in New York City, cover, also covering Hadoop World and Strata Conference going on. And, and we have a special we, presentation this week. We've, we've done a lot of things. We've launched companies on theCUBE this week. We've done product announcements. We've talked to thought leaders. But now we're doing a book signing. So we're pleased to, uh, John and Dave are here with our, one of our favorite guests, the Dean of Big Data, Bill Schmarzo with EMC, uh, who wrote his first book. Big data, understanding how data powers big business. Uh, Bill, welcome back, uh, CUBE alumni, Dean of Big Data, I think we called you that strata three years ago. Yes, yes, uh, you're the ones that coined that term. <laughs> tell right? us yeah. the story, Where, why the book? So uh, the, the, the book really, the inspiration for the book really started three years ago, John, when, when I did that strata conference, I, I did a session at that conference that was called the, the Big Data NBA, and the, the, the aspiration or the goal of that session was to um, really help the technology people understand how the business should be thinking about employing data. So it took a very business-centric approach um, towards uh, understanding um, the value drivers and key business initiatives and how big data could impact that. So um, I did that session. I think John and you and Dave were the guys who coined the term the Dean of Big Data, right? Um, so. Um, it, it, from that point forward, I, whenever I started to write blogs, I had a, a, a framework in mind of what I wanted to tell people. In fact, I was I'm, I'm still working on a class around the Big Data NBA. I'm going to talk to the University of San Francisco about actually um, piloting the class. But the, it all kind of came together. The, um, you know, the Wiley folks reached out to me, courtesy of EMC. Um, we had a lot of material from talking to customers and from writing my blog and such, and it just all came together. Well, you're a tech athlete, as you say, and so we'd love to get you while we're live. Sign the book, you know, get well soon, John. You know, give, give me a little, give me a little John Hancock okay, on there. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, we're excited. Go ahead, sign, sign it up there. Dave, Dave, we're inspiring books now. I mean, the Cube is the open source content model. We love it. Thanks for. Uh, for doing this day. We've been having so much fun for four years now. We've been at Hadoop World. Well, so. it's just awesome seeing, you got to get me too, Bill. All Thank right, you. I it, it's fantastic, John, just seeing the way the whole space is developed. Uh, Bill, I remember, it, it wasn't that long ago, maybe two years ago. I'm not even sure it was that long. It might, might have been two years ago. It was like an EMC CIO conference, and you did a breakout That's on right. big data. And it was really interesting. It was CIO audience. There was a lot of trepidation. You know, a lot of, you know, very much so a lack of knowledge about big data. You were sort of doing the big data 101 yeah. at the time. And now it, the, the compression of knowledge has been so rapid. It's uh, quite amazing. Yeah, I, 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 the, to me what's interesting is that the, 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 the technology sands underneath the big data discussion are still morphing quite fr you know, feverishly. There's new enhancements to existing technologies, you know, Hadoop versions and all the Mahout and MapReduce and there's all kinds of new products coming out. While those sands are, are going through that metamorphosis, the business sides are starting to realize that there is real value in the data and then the technology to tease the insights out of that data, if you, especially if you target organizations' key business initiatives. If you understand what it is the organization is trying to, trying to achieve, whether it's you know, acquiring customers or retaining customers or driving on-time delivery pickups or improving hospital readmissions, if you think about it from a business perspective, it really puts a frame around what data do I need to improve that business process or that business initiative, and then what technologies do I need to, to tease all those insights. And when you, when you take a business-like approach to this, it really takes this, this, this almost mind-numbing amount of technology and greatly simplifies it. You know, <clears throat> one of the inspirations when we started Wikibon was uh, Don Tapscott's book <clears throat> on Wikinomics, and the whole premise of the book was you put it out there, and people will find things that yep. you didn't realize, and good things will happen, and, and it sort of worked out that way. And I've noticed in your book there's a great line here in Chapter 5, one interesting aspect of big data is how it is challenging the conventional thinking regarding how the non-analytical business user should be using analytics. To me, that's the huge opportunity here that we're not even beginning to scratch the surface. So I wonder if you could talk about what your experience is in terms of putting analytic tools and, 
in front of the, the non-analytic, non-typical BI users, which has always been the promise of yes. BI, which yes. never happened. Yes. Is it going to happen here? Well, it, it, I, you know, Dave, you hit on something that's probably my single most biggest passion about big data, which is if, if we create all these great analytics, but we don't surface them, or present them in a way that's actionable to the end users, why bother? Right? Why bother doing it? So the, the ability to take and to conduct and do all that high, high value analytics, munging through all the data, and then how you service it up to users changes dramatically. So, so the, the average user is not an analyst. Right? Right. If you're talking to a brand manager or a, uh, we're dealing with a grocery chain talking how about how we import, empower the store managers, right? Well, they're not analysts. They don't want charts and tables and Excel things and, and BI tools, right? They want to know what's working and what's not working. They want to know, should I buy more Tide or not? Hey, there's a football game next week. It's Stanford versus Cal. The, you better have more beer on hand. And oh, by the way, Stanford and Cal fans don't drink Budweiser. So <laughs> you better make sure you have a higher level of beer in there. So they want to be able to have the technology mine this data, tell them what's going on in the data, and then make recommendations that they can act on. So you are in the services organization at, at EMC. So what are you, how are you spending your time these days? Are you consulting? Are you helping build solutions? Talk about that a little bit. So I, I have by far the best job inside the EMC, which is I get to spend all of my time with customers. Right? And, and what I'm doing with the customers is, is really working them, trying to figure out where and how do we start. What, what business problems are we going after? What data do we have available to us both internally and externally that helps us to, to, to drive that process better? And what technologies do I need to, to, to power that? So I'm able to talk to customers and I'm meeting with, um, I met with the CEO and his staff of, uh, of a large theater chain, right? Trying to figure out how they get more people, more butts and seats in, during off times, right? We had scheduled a half hour meeting with the staff Half hour in, he tells everybody, call your next hour and a half worth of meetings and cancel. We're going to spend two hours here. And we were up on a whiteboard talking about how do we leverage this data? How do we leverage a mobile app? How do we do this? And it was, it, it, it's, it's a great job because I get a chance to see firsthand people trying to tackle really difficult business problems, but leveraging all the capabilities that big data has now brought to us in the last couple of years. It's interesting. You mentioned in your book, about, about for, it's for big business and people using business. You mentioned kind of the MBA kind of approach. I mean, this is the kind of the discussion value chains. You mentioned, you know, uh, some of, a lot of MBA top uh, concepts in the book. Uh, it sounds like customers are pretty intoxicated by the possibilities. So, so the question I have for you is, are they seeing the use cases? Is it more of just kind of you know, exciting them a little bit more? Or what's the, they seemed excited. Yeah. Are they seeing the use cases? Because that has come up as the key issue right now. Validation for big data is there. Now it's, okay, what use cases? So, is it pick and choose at this point? Are they trying to identify it? So I, I think what we're seeing is that, is that the organizations are seeing the use cases, they're reading about them in the press, they're seeing them at conferences, but they want to know what it means to them. How do, how do I make this relevant for my organization? And so while you know, the stories about Facebook and uh, some, you know, some large banks or some large insurance company may be interesting, for them it's not concrete. Yeah, Google can do it. <laughs> yeah, Google great. can do it. Well, they like to say, well, we're not, what the heck, we're not Google, right? We're not Facebook, right? So they want to make sure it's relevant for them. I, I like to coin this term, I think it's in the book, I call it the four M's of big data, right? Make me more money. Right? That's what they want to do, is understand how they make more money. So there's a point in the discussion where you've got to take it from the abstract to what's it mean to them. And, and that's where it starts to become interesting, where you, you take a, 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 a part of the business, a particular business initiative they're trying to accomplish, and you try to, you build that out, you mock it up, you build a lab around it, you show them ramifications, you show them the business case, you show them the ROI, you show them the lift. That's when they start getting excited, because now you're talking about them. And so I think with their issue they've got with many vendors, many vendors talk about the vendors. Most vendors aren't talking about the customer, me. Right? And so I think when you get into a dialogue with a customer, you're talking about them, what's interesting to them, what's most important to them, and you can show how big data can, can, can make that come to life, that's when things get really exciting. They get all jazzed, and, and you start to see some of the organizational boundaries start to melt aside. I want to ask you about the organizational issues. We, we were at the, the Q party last night, saw you there. One of the, one of the surprise guests that walked in was uh, this, the chief data officer at the Federal Reserve, who we interviewed at the uh, MIT Data Quality Conference. It was, a, it was a, a symposium for chief data officers. And the premise of that ev event, Bill, was really that the chief data officer, if you want to be a data-driven organization, you've got to have a chief data officer. And that individual needs to be separate from IT. Now, it was a con yep. controversial concept. Uh, now, many 
uh, industries, particularly financial services, government, maybe healthcare that are highly regulated, you're seeing that take place largely from a governance push, but not so much from a make me more money push. So I'm wondering your thoughts on that whole chief data officer role. Should there be a data czar? Should it be included? Is the CIO the data czar? Should it be separate or, or integrated? So is, it, is this a setup for the book? Totally. It's, because <laughs> I actually, I have a chapter here I talk about the chief data well, officer. I figured you must have, but yeah, and, and I really the, want you to weigh in on this. Yeah, the, I think the chief data officer, I think you're spot on. It's separate from IT. In fact, my recommendation is it's economics major. Mm. Somebody with an economics background who can help put value around data who understands what the data is worth, what is how. If I'm gonna go out and try to acquire data, how do I put value around what that data is worth to me? And, and then also, an economics person can look at it from a risk and compliance perspective. What are the costs associated with, you know, with, with you know, not being in compliance? So um, I, I totally agree that organizations need to have this chief data officer who's got this economics background and sort of this hunger for how do I bring more data in. Likewise, I eventually think you're gonna see organizations have what I'm gonna call a chief analytics officer which is somebody who is going through the organization, uncovering all this analytics IP that organizations have, and even you know, corralling it, inventorying it, versioning it, and maybe even putting legal bounds around it. So you know, somebody with a law degree might be a, better, a really good chief analytics officer who's trying to take that IP that you developed and actually put legal protection around it. So there's the swim lanes of this new organization are kind of funky, because you got data science, you yep. got your chief analytics officer, you got privacy, you got legal, you got governance, you got information management. Do those all sort of report under the, the CDO? Is there a mix? Is there a matrix? Is there, you know, I mean, I know it depends, but yeah. it's a complicated situation. And, and, and you've also missed what I think is, what we mentioned earlier, one of the most key roles is my, my user experience, right? Yeah, uh, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I have a user experience officer. Maybe you yeah. do. I, organizations should. If you're, if you're, most, most organizations, you know, smartphone apps kind of suck. Right? It's the, the, the good ones are really few and far between because they don't really think about it from a user experience perspective. They think about it from yeah, you, a corporate messaging perspective. So, so, yeah, I'll add to that mix by saying... UX, that, right? The pri uh, privacy, security, I mean... Yeah, so you need to have a user experience. What the hell is the CIO going to do? Yeah, <laughs> just make me more money, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do think you're, but you're hitting spot on yeah. is that you, you're going to have all these new roles. Um, I don't know if they report to the CFO, they report to the COO, they report to the, you know, I'm not sure where they go and, and, and we'll learn as we, yeah, as we figure go. it out and evolve. But I do think those roles, no matter where they report, those roles are critical. You know, a, a person who's, who's day, in, day, in, day in and day out focused and they wake up in the morning, go to bed at night, they're thinking about data. How do I get more of it? How do I protect it? How do I get value to it? Somebody on, on the analytics side trying to figure out how do I leverage all this analytics IP I have? How do I patent it? How do I maybe even resell it, monetize it? And this user experience person who has a, a passion for the user is saying, okay, are we, we, got, we capture all this data about our customers, but are we acting on it in a way that's, 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 um, that's smart, that's, that's, um, um, that, that, that is in compliance with the with privacy sort of thing. So y these new roles, I think, are going are gonna to pop up. I just don't know where it, they well, And it is somewhat of an organizational do-over, to use a phrase of my friend Paul Gillen. If you just pave the cow path you know, with, with, and roll data in, you're not going to be as effective as you really think about the organization and how to best leverage these new roles. Oh, I think you're spot on. In fact, I, I, I think that's a key point is because today we treat data as a cost element. I mean, data warehousing technologies are so darn expensive that we've gone through a process of trying to minimize how much data we have. Right. So if you pave the cow path, we'll never bring data in, right? So what we want to do is we want to get to that point where we've got that organizational reset where you're bringing in data as an asset and you have somebody who's really focused in on making that successful. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago where you know, data was uh, something that had to be managed, you know, reduced data, compressed data, ah, backup, it's just insurance. And Chuck Hollis wrote about this. He said the bit has flipped yeah. you know, into, from, from that to make more money. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about the, um, there's a thread, I'm just on the crowd chat. I love this crowd chat. I can, Dave knows all I can do is talk about crowd chat <laughs> these days. Um, but the, the, we're getting some great interaction on crowdchat.net slash strataconference, but comes up the, the concept of data artists is, artistry is, is interesting, Ooh, right? You mentioned cool term, yeah. chief uh, user experience officer. Yeah. Are you seeing customers thinking about the art of, of big data in the sense of this is certainly a science. I mean, we get data science. You know, we had a quote yesterday on our crowd chat that, uh, around data science. It's about 200,000 data scientists in the world, and that number is certainly going to grow. But there's over 2 million analysts that aren't like the Python writing data science geeks, right. but those are future data science in training. Amen. So over 2 million people that will be kind of, quote, the new data science. But for normal people, right, it's users you mentioned. 
is there a chief user experience officer opportunity around the art of big data? What have, what have you heard from customers? Are they that level of, of, uh, of walking erect, if you will, in the, in the spirit of you know, you know, evolution of big data? Are they, are they still kind of you know, still in the early days of like, uh, just walk, learning to walk a little bit? How, how far, where are we on that whole well, the, spectrum? The, the data artist concept's pretty cool. That's a cool idea, and, and I'm not sure it's a role as much as a characteristic. I mean, I would want my user experience person our team to have sort of an artist aspect. And, and when I think about artists, I, I think about somebody who is trying to, um, you know, carve out an experience that's very rewarding, interesting, natural, and actionable. Um, I also can see, you know, there's, there's artistry in the, in the data science, the, the chief data officer, in trying to be creative and, and paint a picture with different data sources. You know, do I, do I you know, do I try to bring in local event data by screen scraping Eventbrite? Do I bring in you know, Zillow housing price data in order to get a better feel for the, the wealth effect that my customers might be having? So you, you, you kind of have that artist aspect of, and, and it's, and it's kind of like experimentation in my opinion, but it's, but it's got a finer edge to it. It's, it's not just experimenting for experimentation purposes, it's experimenting because you want to change how things look and feel. What are your thoughts on, on privacy and big data? You know, this is coming back <clears throat> around because it's becoming quite obvious that, I mean, we had uh, Avi Mehta on uh, yesterday and he was talking about some of the things that, that his firm's working on. One of the big areas they attacked was risk. And we probed down a little bit, talking about risk of credit risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I can very, you know, pretty accurately start to infer race, religion, sex, you know, based on yep. a number of things, what people are listening to, and yep. what they're buying, et cetera. And there really are no privacy guidelines around that. So it's like the wild, wild west. People are going to start collecting all this data. Um, it's almost like the music's going to stop and whoever has the most data ends up the next axiom. Yeah. So <laughs> what's your take on what's going to happen there? What is, what is the state of privacy? How much are clients actually thinking about that, either exploiting it or being careful about it? And where do you see it all going from a you know, government standpoint? Well, I think privacy is, is um, on the forefront of, of many organizations, especially large organizations. You know, the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, as you, as you alluded to there, was, you know, is very tricky about, um, you know, you, you can't make uh, credit decisions and uh, credit extension decisions based on, you know, race and, and sexual gender and things like that. But you're exactly right. I can interpret a lot of that. Right? I can score that. I can score that. I can be, I can be some fairly accurate, right, 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 about that. So I, I think organizations are actually really concerned about that. And I actually think that, that we're, we could very well see yet another role uh, around decision governance. That is, just because you know something, do you act on it? And, and, and my favorite example in decision governance is the, is the Target story, right? Where Target um, had, it, had, had scored this, that this, this one person was a female and was pregnant and they were showing her you know, ads for, you know, for diapers and baby cribs and the father saw this and freaked out and went to his local Target store and read him the riot act and then found out two weeks later she was pregnant. Right? So, um, and, and I, a lot of data scientists are pretty proud of that story because they, they knew before the father. I think that's a horrible story because, because I think there's a, there's a point here where just because you know something doesn't mean you should act on it. And I've got to believe that if Target could figure out that was a girl who was pregnant, they probably had a pretty good idea what her age was. And they probably knew that she was underage, right? They had a score that probably said her, her age is in this range here. So I think you're going to see this, this emergence of this decision, decision governance type role that's going to look at privacy issues, it's going to look at the data they're uncovering, and they're going to try to figure out, and they're going to make a decision at a corporate level whether I want to act on that data or not. Again, just because I know something doesn't mean I should act on it. And many times I don't want that, that decision of action left to my campaign manager or my webmeister who may not have the same kinds of... Um, of privacy concerns that my chief officers are going to have. What's your call on this? Do you think it's going to be self-policing or do you think the big hand of government is going to have to come down and well, adjudicate? I think the way the government's playing right now, I think government wants to get involved in everything. So um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think the government will, the problem with the government is they're always a decade behind. Right? I think they're still trying to figure out how to regulate faxes right now. So um, I, I, just, I just don't know if the government will be able to, it can't move as fast as technology. So. I think that it's, what's going to happen is a, 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 a critical mass of organizations are going to have to come together and put together some rules that are both protect the user and still allow the businesses to do what they want. 
Because if they don't, the government's going to come in, and they're going to come in with recommendations that are a decade old. So I want to follow up on that because, you know, as we all know, government's not one government. There's like a zillion governments. And so <laughs> you know, the government's a decade behind in so many aspects. But one that they seem not to be a decade behind on is big data. You know, you look at the NSA and see what's happening there. The I mean, open data initiatives underway, that's wonderful, yeah, right? The right. data.gov stuff, I, I agree. Yeah. And a lot of that intellectual property is starting to seep out into, you know, the commercial world, right? It's like to see the guys from Squirrel spin off from the NSA. Yeah. So, you know, it's another example, perhaps, of, of the, you know, the government funding, you know, innovation, right? You saw it with, with, with nuclear, you've seen it, you know, with, with the solar, internet, yeah, you yeah. Know, solar, right? Yeah. So. I actually think, you know, I'm, I'm actually really excited about the open data initiative, mm, yeah. you know, and, and what the government's doing as far as making all this data available. I'll be honest with you, our data scientists use that data all the time. We're constantly bringing that data into our, into our projects. We're trying to figure out if we can tease insights out of it. And it's, it's wonderful that they've gone to this and, and sort of open sourced all this different data. And so, you know, I, kudos to the government for doing that. As you said, there's, parts of the, there's many parts of the government. That part of the government is, is getting it right. The, the people who regulate tend to struggle. So we have another, another comment on Twitter here. I want to run by you because this is good good comment from a thought leader out there. Um, uh, he says, at, at Furrier, I find, it, I find that getting started by asking one question then we'll, we'll answer many more to follow. Math is just a part of it. I would claim logic more. So the conversation is developing is, you know, math is great, but it's the insight, it's the art of, of the big data. So that's kind of the use case kind yeah. of that conversation. So uh, his point. point is, it's iterative. It's, you're, you're going through it. Do you find that, you, you agree with that statement, and, and what's your experience with customers? Is it like, let's tackle one thing that opens up a, a window into more, or is, it, or is it more throw a bunch of stuff on the table? That's a, I think that's a great point. Um, I, I do think it's very iterative. The, the, the one thing that, that that we have found is that every company I've dealt with knows what questions they're trying to ask and answer, right? What they don't understand is how does all these new data sources and technology enable me to answer, ask and answer that question either at a different level of granularity or a different level of frequency. And it, in what happens when, when people start getting their, their questions answered, and we kind of learn this in the BI space, they ask more and more. So one of the things about the, in the big data space is we see this, iterative, this iteration process happening more quickly is that people are starting to see the answers and are asking the next level of questions, next level of questions, and it is very iterative, and, it's, and it, is, it is a fairly logical flow that they will, they will ask the first level of questions and they'll keep drilling down. They want to know why, what happened here, and et cetera. So um, I agree with that point. I think it's, it is a very iterative process, and we also, as part of that, we also tell organizations, don't worry about finding the business problem to go after. Find a. Don't pick the, pick a business problem, because w just get started. And innovation and creativity is, is contagious. We, we run these vision workshop processes. I'm always amazed, once we start this process going, how somebody who has been sitting in the back has been quiet and really doesn't, doesn't really seem to be too engaged, they're the one coming up with the best ideas. <laughs> and the group just sort of plays off each it's other. like the bottom of the lineup in a, in yeah. a baseball game, yeah, it's right? Like they're just well, that's, that's the thing. I mean, we, you know, we, you know, we're at the GE event. One of the things is ever, anyone can be Billy Bean, to use the money ball example, which you know, in our industry is a little bit overplayed. But you know, to the average person, like, oh, that makes sense. Money ball is a common thread. Um, and, and I want to ask you that, because that's, really, that's a key value, that anyone in the organization can be an analyst without being an analyst. It's, yes. it's a unique perspective and contribute. So, so that's a key point. I also want to go back to the, what you said earlier, which is getting a lot of traction on Twitter, the four M's of big data, <laughs> make me more money, um, which is clever, it's a great sound bite, always good to have that on the news. <laughs> you know, four P's of marketing, you know, put your MBA hat Three on. Three V's of big data, yeah, the, the four M's, M's of big data. data. Yeah. Yeah, We've got all kinds of slogans here in the queue, but that's a good one, make me more money. But what that really means is, all businesses are in business to make profit, but right. it's not about just the money, it's about the user experience. So it's about, the customers looking at the things that they do that make money. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, and that's why, is that why it's getting a lot of traction? Yeah, and, and, and it's a good point is that organizations are, are with all this customer data and insights and, and the four M's as kind of the corporate charter, they have to carefully balance about the making money portion versus the user benefit portion. I mean, a grocery chain would love to have all of their customers buy all the private labels, right? Margins better, right? They're going to make a lot more money if I got if you came in and buy, you know, generic Billy beer and things like that, right? <laughs> but the customer experience. I mean, if I'm pushing things to customers that don't benefit the customer, eventually the customer is going to revolt and go away, right? The customer yeah. ultimately. So it's not about just on margin. And you're saying it's don't push Billy beer if that's not what the customer is serving. The customer is what drives the business model, right? Exactly. You've got to look longer term. How do I? I mean, not only how do I build 
you know, try to get more revenue and profit from that customer, which is, you know, in balance of the experience, but I ultimately want to build advocacy. I, mean, I want customers out there who have a high likelihood to recommend, who are referring me, to, who are referring other people to me. I want to build a community around what I've got to offer. And if, if I'm shortchanging somebody, if I'm, if I'm even for a moment taking advantage of what I know about them, they're going to revolt, and they're going to vote with their feet, and they're going to vote with their po pocketbooks. So that's a, this, it's a very tricky balance. Okay, so I want to just get more, just plug the book again, congratulations. So we're doing book signings here. Again, Innovation in the Cube, we, you know, we have books <laughs> from, Wy thanks to Wiley and Sons, we appreciate that. So uh, big data, understanding how uh, data powers big business. Obviously, you know, we were at the GE event, Industrial Cloud, Dave and I were, were talking with the CEO of, of GE and his, and his staff, and, and top customers like United Airlines, oil, oil and gas customers, Apache, ComEd Utility, and then you know, healthcare. These areas have big business issues, I and mean, they're big yeah. businesses. They're not, they have machinery, they have, it's not just math, and and databases, it's actually you know hard assets. Right. Um, that's where the big data world's going. Do you talk about that in the book at all? Is it more of it's still more tech industry related? Um, and, and how do you relate to industries that are newly impacted? So in the book, there are numerous case studies, examples of how different kinds of companies are using um, using data or could be using data and technology. It's I look at it from an industry perspective. In many cases, I, uh, I talk about healthcare, I talk about retail, I talk about insurance, I talk about banking. Um, I also look at it from a business function. I talk about sales and marketing and procurement. So there's, the, the book is, is chock full of, of, of different examples. And the reason why it's full of examples is because I got customers telling them to me, right? So it's, it's you know, the, the, book, the, the book is really, um, if I had to give credit to any one organization, it's, my, it's our customers, right? Who I meet with all the time, who have all these great ideas, who have these challenges, who are freely sharing stuff. And, all I did is just capture, I listened really well. I know I'm not exactly a sharp guy, but I listen really well. Of course, you're, not, you're, of course you're sharp, but, you know, but you're getting data. I mean, you are extracting the signal from the noise out yes. there you're, by talking to the people who spend the money, yeah. <laughs> who actually are in business to serve customers and have an inherent reason to do big data, not that's a shiny new toy. Yes, exactly. So I, I'm, again, I have the best job inside the EMC. I get to spend all my time. All right, so tell us a story me. about the, how the book was written. Obviously, you, you, log a lot of, <laughs> you log a lot of miles. We're Facebook friends, so I see the status updates. Stuck in Iowa, uh, <laughs> on the tarmac. Uh, yeah, it's fun to hear and fun to keep track of. Obviously, we talk sports a lot uh, in Palo Alto, but uh, um, you chipped away at this. Just tell the story of, you know, obviously inspired by the Cube and other, uh, the MBA thing, Estrada. But how did you just get it done? I mean, and, and, and take us through the process of writing. It's so Wiley contacted me and they had taken a look at my blog and said, hey, you have a lot of really interesting material in your blog. We think you had the ability to turn that into a book. And, and my, my first reaction was, ah, the book? That's going to be a lot of work. And, <laughs> and so I, they actually, so I was sitting down with my family over supper one night and uh, we, were, we were talking about it and I happened to mention, I said, I've been contacted about you know, writing a book and I don't know about it. And it was, I think it was Alec, my oldest son, who said, you know, he said, well, I think my daughter, the youngest one, says, how much money are you going to make, <laughs> right? And I said, well, you know, you don't make much money on a book, right? So, and my son said, well, why don't you donate some of the proceeds to, to, to something interesting? And I said, well, yeah, my mom died from breast cancer. So um, part of the proceeds of the book are going to be donated to breast cancer. And to be honest with you, that was the moment that I realized I need to write this book. Awesome. Right? It was, you know, um, there was something there that I had a chance to give back. And so... That became the motivating factor. And then, as you said, John, now I, I spent a lot of time on the road. You know, flying from, from San Francisco to Chicago is like a four and a half hour flight, or going to Kansas City or New York or Boston. Those are long flights. So, and I've seen every friggin' movie on the airplanes, right? So, <laughs> so what are we going to do, right? I'm, I'm not going to watch a movie. And so, you'd write. I, you know, I write in hotel lobbies. I write in, the, you know, Starbucks across the street. Well, you're a big I'm, guy. You flying coach. You have elbows. I mean, oh, you have a carp tunnel. Come I always on, get that you? emergency <laughs> exit row so I have a little bit more room, right? Yeah. But, you know, I just, you know, you, I've, I was on the road so much that, you know, you, if you're spending, you know, 20 hours a week in hotels and airplanes and such, it, it just I ended up, my goal was to bang out a chapter a week. So it took about four months or so to get it done, four or five. Right. We're here live in New York. This is the Cube, our Big Data NYC, covering all the action in Big Data in New York City, Hadoop World, and Strata Conference right across the street. This is an amazing segment with our friend and guest Cube alumni, Bill Schmarzo, who we coined the big Dean of Big Data because he was teaching people, and that's what people were learning three years ago, and now ultimately it's validation. Uh, the market's growing. The new book, uh, go get it. It's from Wiley's and 
business on big data, understanding how data powers big business. Read this book, it's really great. Um, it's more business oriented, so if you have an MBA and you, you're not a geek, but you want to understand kind of how to get your arms around it, read this book, it's a great book. Bill, thanks so much. Uh, we'll be right back with our next guest live in New York City. This is theCUBE, I'm John with Dave, we'll be right back.